The Levante is a luxury SUV from a brand you possibly wouldn't expect to be making such a thing. It's a luxury crossover with rather exotic jeans, and a car that in recent years has been crucial for its maker, Maserati. It's a mark of the rise and rise of the SUV that every single luxury brand knows it has to have such a thing in its model portfolio. This Levante was Maserati's first interpretation of the genre and it's been continually improved over its production life to create the version we're going to try here. Quite a lot's changed since we first saw this so-called Maserati of SUVs back in 2016. Uh, prior to that, the brand had been dabbling with the crossover concept for years, uh, showing its Kubang concept at motor shows as long ago as 2003. That Giugiaro prototype was finally updated in 2011, but it took until 2016 to get it into production, badged as the Levante. It was the first model in the company's history to be assembled in any volume, and that was in a refurbished part of Fiat's historic Mirafiori factory in Turin, and it quickly accounted for the vast majority of the company's global sales. But initial customer interest in this car quickly tailed off and Maserati found itself having to make rapid improvements. V8 petrol power models joined the range in 2018 and a cross the lineup update followed in 2019. And in 2020, the V6 diesel engine, which had accounted for most sales from launch, was dumped in favour of a four cylinder, two litre uh, mild hybrid petrol power plant. The same unit which would subsequently be used for most versions of the only slightly smaller SUV model which Maserati eventually announced to sell alongside the Levante, the Grecale. With that extra SUV now in the company's lineup, some today have begun to question the Levante's continuing place in Maserati's portfolio. But the company needs this larger model if it's going to be able to continue to offer a credible alternative to cars like Porsche's Cayenne and the Mercedes GLE Coupe in this segment for GT-style large luxury performance SUVs. So, would you and could you justify a Levante? Well, you'll need the industry's most comprehensive review, the car and driving road test, to find that out. If you were hoping that this uh, Levante might be some sort of cut price Ferrari Puro Sangue, uh, then there might be the need for a bit of mental readjustment before you fully acquaint yourself with this Maserati. Even in the fieriest 580 horsepower, 3.8 litre petrol V8 form that we're trying here, it's really not much like one of those, despite this top version's emotive Maranello sourced powertrain. The engines tasked with delivering the sales volume that the Bologna brand needs from this model are rather different again. Uh, there's no longer the grumbly 3-litre V6 diesel, which is all you could have when this car was first launched back in 2016. Uh, instead, Levante customers needing to keep their spend on the right side of a lucky lottery win choose between two petrol options, either the 430 horsepower 3-litre petrol V6 or, more likely, the Alpha-derived mild high hybrid 2-litre petrol 330 horsepower four-cylinder engine which also sustains this model's Grecale SUV showroom stablemate. Now you might think that a humble four-pot power plant uh, would be ill-suited to an exotic Latin GT crossover that bears the same bonnet badge as Juan Manuel Fangio's 250F50s F1 car. Actually, though, uh, Maserati claims that this base powertrain uh, helps rather than hinders this Levante in its quest for Porsche Cayenne-style driving dynamics. Uh, the smaller engine offers a useful 24 kilo weight saving over the V6, and although a lot of that is offset by the addition of the mild hybrid system's battery pack, uh, the rear-mounted positioning of that pack uh, apparently improves weight distribution, although you would probably need a few laps on the company's modern a test track before you notice the difference there, by which point you'd certainly have noticed that the 2-litre model has significantly less mid-range grunt than the 3-litre V6. There's 130 newton meters less torque to play with, although the performance figures actually aren't that much different, uh, with 
four cylinders, the Levante powers to 62 miles an hour in six seconds en route to 152 miles an hour. Uh, with six cylinders, those figures are improved to 5.2 seconds and 164 mph. Even the soundtrack, rather surprisingly, isn't massively different between the two engines. Uh, the engineers apparently worked for ages to give the uh, electrified base Levante a traditional Maserati growl. And this cuts in once you've given the car a bit of a boot to get going and got the e-booster electric turbocharger spinning through the mid-range. Uh, you would never mistake this for a traditional high revving Italian engine though and there's really very little incentive to thrash it up to the red line. Still, the 8-speed ZF automatic transmission, which works through an electro-hydraulic actuated Haldex multiplate clutch, responds with smoothness and alacrity, uh, particularly if you decide to take control yourself with these cool Ferrari-style alloy paddle shifters and click out of the normal drive mode into green-themed sport. Now, the V8 version that we're trying here adds an extra orange-themed coarser drive mode too. When it's engaged, drop the car by 35 millimeters, stiffen the ride, sharpen the throttle responses, and give more aggressive gear changes. And all that will fire you to 62 miles an hour in just 4.1 seconds en route to 188 mph. Whatever your engine choice, what's unusual about this car is the way that it's constantly able to monitor the location of its center of gravity. Every time you turn the wheel, uh, the Levante is able to determine the load that it's carrying and to work out what it'll do to its center of gravity. It'll then continuously adjust its standard air springs and its skyhook electronic dampers to suit. As a result, Maserati claims that this car understeers less than many of its rivals. This is helped by the near perfect weight distribution that we referenced earlier on and a 4x4 drive line that sends 90% of the engine's torque to the back axle by default. If a lack of traction demands it, this proportion can be readjusted in just 150 milliseconds though. An S-designated centre console suspension button can firm up the adaptive damping system, but the resulting ride is so teeth-grindingly brittle on a typical British B-road that you'll rarely want to engage that feature. Uh, it also emphasises this Maserati's tendency to be upset by mid-corner bumps. Driver engagement isn't aided by the kind of fearsome steering feedback you get in a rival Porsche Cayenne, but it is quite precise and its responsiveness doesn't seem to have been much harmed by the switch since launch from hydraulic to an electric rack. Uh, body roll, that's reasonably well controlled too, but this Levante still can't reward through the twisty stuff in the way that an enthusiast attracted by the brand might hope for. And aside from Cayenne comparisons, you'd also come to the conclusion that rivals like Audi's Q8 and the Range Rover Sport were better dynamically engineered uh, way to drive those cars back to back with this one which is not likely to be a deal breaker for someone attracted by a Levante. Maserati does have its Gricale if you like the brand but you want a wieldier SUV. As a GT Grand Tourer though this larger model does feel more accomplished aided in no small measure by excellent levels of refinement. Now, can you go off-road in a Levante? Well, actually, yes. Thanks to the standard air suspension, this Maserati comes with adjustable ride height, plus there's hill descent control, uh, plenty of wheel travel, an ice driving mode for slippery mornings, and an off-road mode too, which raises the ride height by 25 millimeters. For really difficult terrain, uh, there is a possibility to increase the ride height further uh, as high as 50 millimeters, but if you seriously take to the undergrowth in this Italian SUV, you're a very brave buyer indeed. Whether or not you like the Levante in its finished form, it can at least be credibly described as a Maserati, which actually wasn't the original concept. Now, the Cubang Motor Show prototype, which sired this model, um, which was first shown way back in 2003, was originally supposed to run on Jeep hardware and be built in the US, which wouldn't have been very Maserati at all, would it? You might still wonder whether this 
finished product actually is. I mean, it rolls down a production line uh, alongside all electric Fiat 500s at the Italian giant's Mirafiori plant in Turin, but all the classic styling cues feature, and there's a bit more pavement presence here than the brand's only slightly smaller Gricale SUV can offer. Not that the tinseled trinketry means very much. Uh, these three little front wing vents here don't do anything other than reference a largely forgotten era when Maseratis had sprawling multi-cylindered engines which needed extra cooling, rather than a time in which most versions of this Levante will be sold with four-cylinder mild hybrid power, uh, something you might think better suited to a Fiat family hatch but this profile perspective with the branded C pillar and the Italian tricolour badged B pillar will say all the right things to your table host when you pitch up outside your favourite wine bar, particularly if you upgrade the standard 20 inch wheels for even more enormous alloys. Uh, here we've got red calipered 22 inch Orione black staggered rims. This front end gets the kind of menacing overtaking presence that owners will want with this huge trident badged grille, separate spotlights below the slim LED beams and gaping front corner cutouts. This V8 version gets a few extra touches too, uh, twin scoops for the fluted bonnet and carbon fibre trimming for the lower front splitter. After all that aggression up front, the rear perspective uh, rather disappointingly anonymous with its chrome strip connected smeared back uh, tail lamps and its subtle roof spoiler. Although the twin tailpipes at either corner of this lower diffuser here hint at the power that might lurk beneath that aluminium bonnet. That metal is actually used extensively around the structure and the bodywork. Uh, you'll also find it in the doors and here in the tailgate. Despite that, the Levante is still a pretty heavy thing. Uh, it tips the scales at over 2.2 tonnes, and that makes it significantly heavier than rivals like the Range Rover Sport and the Porsche Cayenne. What you'll be wanting, though, is a true Maserati experience once inside. So is that what you get? Well, let's open this frameless door and take a look. Well, it certainly feels special, uh, although it's special enough to justify this car's ambitious pricing is another question. Now, we're testing this car right near the end of its production lifespan, so perhaps it's unfair to point out that the cabin architecture here now feels rather dated, particularly in terms of the size of the central screen and the continuance of analogue instrument dials. Still, Maserati's Gricale SUV provides a more modern spin on these things if they really matter to you. We suspect, though, that a potential Levante customer will be minded to concentrate instead on the exquisite touring tinsel provided here, uh, the white double-stitched extended leather dash, uh, the quilted door cards, the Alcantara roof lining, the silver-branded door scuff plates, uh, the neat little A-pillar speakers, and the potential to add silver pedals and lottery-level embellishments like carbon fibre centre console trim. More importantly, as you'd expect from a Maserati, huge, coolly crafted metal paddle shifters sit behind the steering wheel, and there's a classic analog clock at the top of the dash. Also, as you'd expect from a Maserati, uh, these additions haven't really been properly thought through. The travel on the paddle shifters is too long, and the Art Deco facing on this clock makes it difficult to read at night. Uh, in contrast to the high console cockpit style feel of a rival Porsche Cayenne, the driving position here is unapologetically commanding. That's not particularly sporty, but it is ultimately welcome given the enormous expanse of that bonnet ahead. You might prefer that over what's offered by the competing Porsche, but regardless of perch preference, uh, you'll definitely miss that KN's impeccably crafted switch gear. Uh, the quality of it here is distinctly hit and miss, low points being the plasticky column stalks and the rather hidden Chrysler part spin start button. Even more annoying is the old fashioned gear selector. Uh, now you'll find this 
constantly frustrating when you're in a hurry and you're trying to activate, drive, reverse or park in a single movement. As for the thickly padded seats, well, they are multi-adjustable, but they're rather too big. So if you try to drive your Levante as a Maserati should be driven, you'll quickly find yourself sliding around on them. It is nice that you can easily adjust pedal positioning though. We mentioned the instrument binnacle dials earlier on. Uh, they're old fashioned gauges, in our opinion, rather suited to the kind of car this is trying to be. Uh, the dials are separated by a central screen with selectable central elements flanked by fuel and temperature readouts. Uh, you'll usually leave that in the main menu setting and that shows the digital speedo, uh, your compass reading, your drive range, gear selection, your drive mode and an odometer. Uh, using a steering wheel toggle switch though, you can uh, also change that display and that will show either tire pressures, drive assist information or trip computer data. What about infotainment? Well, that's delivered by this 8.4 inch Maserati Touch Control Plus center stack screen, which is a reskinned version of the Uconnect setup that's still used by Fiat's and Alphas. You don't get over the air updates, uh, the voice control system, that's not up to much. And there can sometimes be a bit of a delay uh, when you're switching between menus there. Otherwise though, apart from the slightly restricted size, this MTC Plus setup still feels pretty up to date with a modern segmented home screen wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring and shortcut buttons along the bottom of the frame for navigation, phone, vehicle info, apps and media. Uh, there's also a comfort screen for climate control but thankfully you're not dependent on that because there's a separate panel of analog ventilation switch gear just below the monitor. As for cabin storage, well, there isn't much of that. Uh, this butterfly lidded box between the seats here turns out to be really shallow. Uh, the door bins are tiny and there's no overhead compartment for your sunglasses. Still, the lid of the compartment at the base of the center stack here has a lovely damped back mechanism and that slides back to reveal a USB A port, an aux in socket, remember them, and a wireless charging mat. Uh, there is another cubby to the left of the gear lever with twin cup holders and a 12 volt socket. And you get a big flock lined glove box with an interior compartment, plus there are ticket clips and the sun visors. Um, all round visibility isn't too bad from the front or sides, but the low wide rear window is partially obscured by the rear head restraints. Right, time to take a look in the back. Uh, this Levante is 158 millimeters longer than its Gricale SUV showroom stablemate. but it doesn't really feel it once you take your place in the back seat. Yes, a couple of adults will fit comfortably, but the 710 millimeter legroom figure that Maserati quotes is some way short of the 790 mil reading that you'll get in a rival Porsche Cayenne, and it feels it. Uh, the lower backrest sculpting feels odd around your lumbar regions, but that might pay dividends on longer trips, uh, when you might also appreciate the fact that the backrest reclines, although as usual in this class, the seat base is fixed. Uh, thanks to these quarter light windows here, at least it's quite an airy place to sit, even if you haven't specified this test model's glass sunroof. That further restricts headroom, by the way. Even without it, taller folk may find their hair brushing the Alcantara headliner. You'd hope that given this car's now near six-figure starting price, the kind of tri-zone rear climate controls you now get on a Golf might be standard, but no, they're an expensive extra, like the rear seat heating also fitted here. Still, take in the quality you're surrounded with, uh, which in this particular case extends to door cards with carbon fibre trim and twin silver meshed speakers. A flap above the central uh, vents here conceals twin USB-C ports and a 12 volt socket. Uh, there are decent door bins and there are netted seat back pockets too. You get overhead reading lights, an armrest with cup holders, uh, coat hooks in the grab handles and a further hook on each B pillar. Let's finish with a look at boot space. Uh, the powered tailgate rises to reveal a 580 litre boot, which is only 45 litres more than the Gricale. Uh, at least on the base mild hybrid model, your space is unimpeded by the addition of a battery pack below the floor. 
To be fair, the carriage capacity total isn't too far off what you get from an obvious class rival. Uh, Porsche's KN Coupe offers 592 litres, while Audi's Q8 has 605 litres. A shallow tray resides beneath the boot floor with a useful hooked strap to hold it up when you want to use the space. This impractical stainless steel boot floor panel is optional, but you do get an elasticated strap and a 12 volt socket on the right, bag hooks and a light on both sides, and four silver tie downs. A ski hatch is provided too for longer items. An astonishing oversight though is the absence of any obvious way of folding the 60-40 split backrest from back here. Uh, you have to go around to the side doors and release a catch on each seat base. Now that does free up uh, 1,652 litres of space. You won't be expecting this Levante to be inexpensive, and it isn't. Uh, introducing the only slightly smaller Gricale SUV beneath this model has emboldened the brand to push the Levante a little further up market, with the result that by the time of this test in autumn 2023, uh, the least expensive GT Ultima version, a recipient of the brand's mild hybrid 2 litre petrol 330 horsepower four cylinder engine was priced at around £93,000. The alternative V6 Moderna Ultimate model featuring a 430 HP 3 litre petrol V6 was pitched at nearly £115,000. Here we've got the 580 horsepower 3.8 litre petrol V8 Trofeo model, uh, which as we filmed was only available in a special run out V8 Ultima form, costing around £160,000. Now Maserati told us they'd be making only 206 more of these V8 Levantes. The final production divided equally between Nero Assoluto or striking Blue Royale paintwork. Once they're gone, that'll be the end of an era. Almost all Levante customers though will stick with the four cylinder model, which looks a little underpowered and under cylindered to command a near six figure price tag. Still, it is undeniably a more exclusive choice than the premium SUVs it's up against, uh, primarily Porsche's Cayenne, but also cars like the BMW X6, the Audi Q8, and the Mercedes GLE Coupe, and the Range Rover Sport. You'll need to decide whether that's enough for you and whether a Levante really is worth nearly £25,000 more than a version of the brand's Gricale SUV with exactly the same four-cylinder engine. Should you decide it is, then you're going to need to know exactly how generously equipped this car really is. Uh, drive stuff includes various things that you'd have to pay extra for on a Gricale, uh, the height adjustable air springs and electronic dampers, for example, plus a limited slip rear differential. You also get torque vectoring and self-leveling suspension too. Disappointingly though, on a car of this price, it's necessary to pay quite a slug extra, over two and a half thousand pounds more for adaptive cruise control. Outside the four cylinder model comes with 20 inch Efesto dark Myron staggered wheel rims featuring black calipers and inside you're treated to a cabin primarily trimmed in dark Nero leather with Rosso stitching on the dashboard which can also be extended into the upholstery. Uh, that stitching also features on carpets which are embellished with velour floor mats and of course the seats are power adjustable and they're heated. Uh, they're eight-way variable with four-way lumbar adjustment and they offer two memory options for the driver's side. Uh, there's a leather stitch sport steering wheel too and the uh, required standard of media connectivity while well, that's provided via an 8.4 inch Maserati touch control plus central screen that comes with navigation along with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring. Obviously, there's plenty of further scope for options. Uh, with base GT Ultima spec, you can also add two further packages, a sport package, uh, which gives you a special sport rear spoiler, plus adaptive full LED matrix headlights, an upgraded dual cast braking system with black painting calipers, uh, Grand Sport style front and rear bumpers, and brushed stainless steel pedals. On a four cylinder Levante, you might also want the Nerissimo package. Now that includes larger 21 inch 
and Teo black staggered wheels, uh, body colored door handles, and also a dark finish for the roof rails, for the window framing, and also for the tail lights. Uh, now, a number of these uh, features can also be ordered as individual options. Plus, you can also add uh, panoramic sunroof, rear privacy and laminated glass, uh, extended keyless entry via an easy access package, and also heat for the steering wheel and for the windscreen washer nozzles. Now, this V8 test car we have here also features four-zone automatic climate control and a Bowers & Wilkins surround sound audio upgrade with Quantum Logic Tech. It also has Kevlar speakers and 1,280 watts of power. Surprisingly, on all Levantes, it's necessary to pay extra for the brand's easy entry and exit keyless entry system. Across the range, there's a wide choice of paint colors, uh, solid, metallic, and some more exclusive fiorecerie shades. Uh, beware though, some of the shades are eye-wateringly expensive. This test car's blue denim paintwork was listed as 7,020 pounds extra. Style additions include red brake calipers, steel door sills, and a chromed trunk sill. Practical extras include a net and an adaptive divider for the luggage compartment. Plus, if you add roof crossbars, there's a roof box lift and load system. And of course, you can add a tow bar. Uh, by the way, it is also possible to go and pick up your Maserati from the factory and then drive your car onto the brand's Modena test track. We'd tick that box. We'll finish with safety provision. Uh, to be frank, it's only just about acceptable for a car of this price, uh, but you do get forward collision warning with a pedestrian emergency braking system. Uh, plus there's lane keeping assist, active blind spot assist, and traffic sign assist. Plus, of course, uh, there are the usual passive features. There's a full complement of airbags and the usual electronic assistance for braking, traction, and stability control. You don't think about buying a Maserati luxury SUV and then worry too much about the cost of running it. Still, if you are interested, uh, the Italian brand reckons that the Levante Hybrid can cut emissions by 18% over the non-electrified 3.0-litre V6 offered further up the range. Uh, the GT Ultima Hybrid's quoted CO2 figure is uh, nothing to write home about, though, uh, rated at 225 grams per kilometre, with a combined cycle fuel figure of 27.4 MPG. You won't do as well as that with a 3-litre V6 model, of course. Uh, the Modena Ultima manages up to uh, 275 grams per kilometre of CO2 and a best of 23.3 miles per gallon. For this V8 Ultima flagship model, it's a smoky best of 317 grams per kilometre and a theoretical best of 20.2 mpg, although on this test uh, consumption has been ranging between 14 and 17 miles per gallon. Ouch. The figures I've just quoted uh, assume constant operation of the most frugal of the provided drive modes, which is normal, and you can keep an eye on drive efficiency via the selectable trip computer display in the instrument panel. If efficiency is anywhere on your buying radar, then obviously you'll be looking at the four-cylinder model, and you might quite reasonably have hoped for a little more frugality in this electrified era. Uh, the figures for the four-cylinder model really aren't uh, actually that much different from those of a six-cylinder mild hybrid Audi Q8 55 TFSI, uh, 243 grams per kilometre and 26.4 miles per gallon. And they're also not very much different from the readings of the base 3-litre V6 Porsche Cayenne Coupe, uh, something you might have chosen instead, 247 grams per kilometre of CO2 and 25.9 uh, miles per gallon. And that's a car that lacks any kind of electrification at all. The mild hybrid engine is just as we tried recently in the smaller Grecali SUV, and it's a 48 volt system that works as these kinds of setups usually do, with a belt starter generator, a tiny 48 volt battery, an e-booster, and a DC-DC converter. Now, the belt starter generator acts as an alternator, charging the boot mounted battery. In turn, that powers the e-booster fitted to the engine. Overall, the system's job is to recoup some of the energy that's normally lost 
during braking or coasting and use that to assist the engine under load and to power the car's stop-start system and some of its electrical ancillaries. Now because of the age of this Levante design there's no full electric Folgore version such as you'd be offered if you were looking at either the Gracale or the brand's Gran Turismo sports car. What else? Uh, well, now that Maserati has established its SUV credentials, uh, the used market should be quite comfortable when the time comes to sell this Levante. As a result, residual values should be strong. Uh, that's all thanks to the car's relative rarity, of course. Uh, independent experts reckon that it'll hold on to more than 50% of its value after three years and 36,000 miles, which is similar to a rival Porsche Cayenne. And the engines are proven Fiat Group units, so they're unlikely to cause any issues. Whatever Levante you decide on, it'll come with a three-year unlimited mileage warranty. Uh, that's rather better than Audi's three-year 60,000-mile package, but it is comparable to what you get from rivals such as Porsche, BMW and Mercedes. Uh, service intervals, well, they're every year or 12,500 miles, whichever comes around first. And fixed price servicing packages are available, as is fixed price servicing. Plus, uh, because most Maserati dealers are joint franchises with Ferrari workshops, it'll feel like a bit of an event every time you take your car in for a scheduled visit. With just 16 dealers in the UK, though, uh, getting your car in for maintenance might be rather difficult. Too often, Maserati has lived off its past glories and traded on the image of 50s GT sports cars driven by iconic Italian movie stars. The production reality, even in the later part of the last century and the early part of this one, was rather different. Maserati models being those you chose over German rivals only if you were prepared to put up with patchy build quality, frustrating switch gear and borrowed tech. The point when things began to change can be traced to the launch of this Levante back in 2016. And since then, the brand seems to have gained a fresh sense of direction. You'll feel more of that at the wheel of this car's more modern SUV showroom stablemate, the Gricali, but the Levante still has a credible appeal for those besotted with the Trident badge who see nothing un-Maserati-like in the idea of a 2.2-tonne crossover primarily powered by a little 2-litre four-cylinder mild hybrid engine. Combine that with the lately inflated near six-figure starting price and we might find ourselves struggling with that proposition if we were to be in this part of the market. But the Levante feels a more credibly exotic thing with more cylinders beneath the bonnet, particularly in this wonderfully emotive V8 form. You might need a lottery win to enjoy it, but in return, you do at least get an SUV experience which in its own way feels altogether more special than anything the Germans can provide. If that is your perspective, then for rivals, don't think about Audi Q8s or Porsche Cayennes. The feeling here is slightly more Bentley Bentayga, although with a few rough edges here and there. Now, hopefully, those will be ironed away a bit more when the eventual replacement for this car arrives. Until then, you might still enjoy a Levante. In contrast to modern Maseratis of the not too distant past, it's more of a fine Chianti than a corked Prosecco. But there's still a bit of both here that might leave you undecided about signing that final, rather fat check. With Maseratis, it was always thus, and perhaps it always will be.